And of course, I'm sure you're familiar with this idea that depression is caused by a serotonin imbalance. The earlier idea was that it was a monoamine imbalance so because there are other, mono, other monoamines as well as serotonin. Um, and uh, this is often depicted with the, this picture of the nerve and the synapses. It turns out that there has never really been any convincing evidence that there are serotonin or other monoamine abnormalities in depression. There was some uh, work done on serotonin, on a certain class of serotonin receptors, which were thought to be relevant. And some studies showed that there were lower levels of these receptors in people with depression. But then more studies were done, and it turned out that some of them showed that people with depression actually had higher levels of these receptors, and some showed no difference. And basically, the, the research is, is very inconsistent. There were some studies done um, uh, which involved giving people a, a diet which is low in the the molecule that's the precursor of serotonin, which is called tryptophan. Um, and it was thought that that might produce depression in volunteers, but in fact it didn't. Uh, it seemed to possibly make depression worse in people who'd previously had it and been treated for it, but it didn't actually induce it. And there's a much stronger drug that induces a low serotonin um, syndrome in people, and that does in, indeed cause changes, but not depressive type changes. It actually makes people aggressive and hypersexual uh, and irritable and, and paranoid. So there really is no evidence that, that um, depression is caused by low serotonin. Um, what about evidence that psychiatric drugs are superior that, that drugs that are thought to have specific effects on underlying conditions are superior to other drugs? Well, in the case of antipsychotics, there is some evidence that they might be superior to some other forms of sedative. Um, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're working in a disease-centered way because the people who, the, the psychiatrists who used these drugs early on in France, for example, um, they felt that the alterations that antipsychotics produced, were producing were more effective than the sort of alterations produced by barbiturates. But um, actually, they don't look to be that different from other sorts of sedatives in the studies that have been done. So there was a comparison with opium, which showed that chlorpromazine, the earliest antipsychotic, was roughly equal to the effects of opium for people with acute psychosis. Uh, and there have been several studies looking at comparing antipsychotics with benzodiazepines. They're rather old, they're rather ropey studies, but they certainly don't provide evidence that antipsychotics are superior. If anything, they seem to mostly show that benzodiazepines were a bit better. Just skip over that. Um, and uh, if you think about antidepressants, the evidence shows that any substance that causes a mind-altering effect that has some, produces some changes in thinking or behavior or emotions, seems to be slightly better than placebo or comparable to anti antidepressants for the treatment of depression. So as well as classical antidepressants, things like um, amphetamines, benzodiazepines, lots of antipsychotics and opiates have all been shown to be effective in depression in randomized controlled trials. So if we think about um, using a drug-centered model to understand how drugs are working in uh, mental health problems, what does that actually mean? How does that mean they might be working? And so the first possibility is that there is an interaction between the alterations that the drugs are producing and the symptoms that people are having, the difficulties people are having with their behaviors or thoughts or emotions. But the other thing that I think we need to keep in mind is that there are, of course, placebo effects. Um, people often feel hopeful when they're offered a drug, and that can help them feel better in itself. And if they get a drug that produces a few side effects and they know they're on something, something real and active, and haven't just got the placebo, that can produce amplified placebo effects, even stronger placebo effects. So if we're going to approach drug, the, the use of drugs for mental health problems in a drug-centered way, what we need to know is much more information than we currently have about all the changes and alterations that drugs produce all the mental changes, also the physical changes, 
what they do in the long term, how those changes pan out in the sorry, what they do in the short term and how those changes pan out in the long term, because sometimes it's different. If you keep taking a drug, the body will adapt to its presence and the effects that it has immediately don't necessarily continue. And because of that as well, when people stop taking a drug, they can often get quite profound withdrawal symptoms. So we need to know also about withdrawal effects. And when we know, when we've got a really good picture of what sort of effects a drug might have, we can then ask whether those effects might be useful in a particular individual situation. We also, of course, need to ask, even if there are some useful effects, do they outweigh the adverse effects of taking an active substance? And are there alternative ways of dealing with the problem? So just to take a couple of examples of thinking like this about some of the drugs that we already prescribe, I'll start with um, thinking about antipsychotic drugs. These are the drugs that were introduced for the treatment of psychosis and schizophrenia, or at least became, that's what they became associated with. So we do, we do have quite a few animal studies and healthy volunteer studies which have looked at the sorts of alterations that these drugs produce, and they're very consistent, and they show that um, consistent with the idea that these drugs are, some, are nervous system suppressants. They reduce things like movement, attention, reaction times, learning and memory abilities, and they reduce act, uh, activity levels. And subjectively, people say what they feel like when they've taken them is that they feel sedated, tired, and they feel that they lose their emotion, that they lose their motivation and their drive and their initiative and feel sort of emotionally flattened. And uh, these were the effects, as I suggested earlier, that were observed by the first psychiatrist that used them, the French psychiatrist, including this man, Pierre Deneker. So his idea was that what these drugs were doing was basically inducing a new sort of neurological syndrome, which was a bit like Parkinson's disease, because a lot of the early drugs made people, gave people symptoms of Parkinson's disease, made people very stiff um, and, and rigid. Um, and he felt that this neurological syndrome was effectively replacing the mental health problem that the person had, effectively replacing the schizophrenia or the psychosis. And he felt that the emotional suppression was the, what was particularly useful about the effects of these drugs. And he said that what happens with the, was that people who were really preoccupied by their delusions and maybe their hallucinations and other psychotic symptoms just lost interest in them wasn't that the symptoms necessarily went away, but their emotional response to the symptoms was, was dampened down. And if you ask patients today what sort of effects the, these drugs have, they will give you similar answers. Say that they feel stagnant, physically and mentally slowed up and restricted and emotionally empty. Um, I don't want to give the impression that all these drugs are exactly the same. They come from a, a variety of chemical classes and they, there are differences between the individual agents and uh, a drug called olanzapine, that's the, the brand name is Zyprexa, is a little bit different from some of the others and it's, it seems to cause, it still causes this emotional indifference but that, it's, that effect seems to be intimately connected with its effects on appetite and eating um, with this particular drug. So this, this quote captures it well. I was in a constant fog of lethargy and indifference. I didn't care about anything. I just wanted to sit around and eat. Um, and, and a lot of people who, who've taken that drug will say that they just become obsessed with eating and eating particularly bad food, junk food. And these, are, these the sorts of effects also seem to be intimately connected with the therapeutic effects of the drug. They're not separate. It's these, it's these effects on emotions um, that are dampening down the symptoms of psychosis. So people talk about how the drugs help reduce the intensity of their symptoms, and dull them down, numb them a bit. I think this quote summarizes it really well from someone who was taking a haloperidol for a psychotic episode and she says although i felt very well i felt as if i had had absolutely i felt as if i had absolutely nothing to talk about 
I kept wondering about whatever it was that had been so interesting during most of my life that I had suddenly lost. But I was very much in contact with reality, and for that I was thankful. I think that captures brilliantly how uh, the, the dilemma that people are in who, who are undergoing an acute psychotic episode. I think that these drugs can be useful in that situation. If someone's mental life has been taken over by psychotic preoccupations, it may be useful to have that damped down to the extent that people can start to, to join in with the, the real world again. However, we should remember that some people get through an episode of psychosis without taking antipsychotic medication. Um, so they're not necessarily necessary for everyone. Mm -hmm.